Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. It's been said that federal judges have more power than almost any other public officials, with the authority to dramatically change the lives of thousands or even millions of people, and without having to haggle with reluctant legislators or consult with mayors, governors, or even presidents. Judge Shira Shenlin certainly made her mark before retiring recently after 22 years on the bench in the Southern District of New York. And now that she's retired, she's free to speak her mind about the issues and cases that often landed her in the spotlight, including the most controversial case of all, in which she banned the NYPD's stop and frisk policy. Welcome. Thank you. Federal judges have lifetime appointments, and yet you chose to step down at the youthful age of 69. Why now? It's a question I should be good at answering. I've been asked it a number of times. I thought this was the sweet spot, meaning I have, a, I have a good decade left, I think, to do work that challenges me and that I can make a contribution. I don't think I could have waited any longer, and I didn't want to do it any earlier. I, I had a lot of great cases, and I wanted to finish them. But they kind of came to an end, and the wheel uh, doesn't always give you the kind of cases that you like. Yes, you get some, but a lot of the other cases after a number of years are routine. So I thought change is good, change is invigorating, and if I'm lucky, I'm going to get challenging work in the private sector. So my goal in the private sector is to do a lot of public interest type work. I hope to do a lot of civil rights work. Mm -hmm. I hope to be appointed a special master or a monitor in reform type cases involving prisons, hospitals, education, housing, voting, police, all those topics uh, that municipalities and states and federal governments are dealing with. So if I'm lucky, that's what I'll get. You heard what I said about the perception of federal judges as having a great deal of power. I mean, you can, you can order takeovers of school systems. You can mandate huge reforms in police departments and prison systems. You can shut down prisons. You can determine, uh, judges have determined the outcome of presidential elections. Mm -hmm. You can change the country's laws about who can get married. Did you feel this sense of power when you were on the bench? And is that one reason you decided to become a judge? You know, that wasn't one reason I decided to become a judge. I don't think you understand the power until you're there. And I'm not a person who's uh, very excited by power. But once you're there and you get some important cases, you do feel that you have the ability to make change. Don't look at it as power as much as influence. You get to change the direction of something that you think needs to be changed. And so I know that you started out in your introduction mentioning stop and frisk case. I know you're going to want to talk about it more. But there was an opportunity to make a real change. So it's not raw power for power's sake, but it's the opportunity to do what you think is right. I've always wondered how one becomes a judge. Now, we know how one becomes a Supreme Court judge, that process. Um, but for federal judges, for instance, I mean, do you have to express your interest in becoming a judge and get put on some kind of a list of people who are interested? And it doesn't have, does it, do you have to have the backing of some uh, elected official? How does that work? It's a great question, and it depends on what state you're in. Since we're sitting here today in New York City, I can tell you about New York, but you should know it differs by state. So in New York, uh, it turns on the political parties of the two senators. If the two senators are of the same party as the president, it's pretty easy. They both have selection committees. The selection committees uh, interview candidates who come to their attention, either because they've applied or somebody's recommended them, or even the committee has reached out for them. And then they're interviewed, and then the committee makes a list of maybe three or five names, which go to the president, and the president picks one of those three or five that come from the committees. If the senators are of different parties in New York, one from each party, They've been marvelous in New York. They've decided to cooperate. So the majority party will have three out of every four seats, but will give the fourth seat to the minority party. This is a tribute to New York, that they, the two senators have always worked together, and the president's gone along with it. So in New York, that's the way it's been. Now, if both senators are of a different party than the president, then sometimes the president will simply take over. Okay, but the president actually he makes does. the appointment. He does, or maybe she will. Um, before taking your seat, 
You were an assistant U.S. attorney, you were a commercial lawyer, you were general counsel for the New York City Department of Investigation, and you were special master in two big tort cases. Um, so when you actually took your seat um, uh, in the Southern District, how was, how was it different from what you had done before? Maybe I didn't listen well enough, but did you also say magistrate judge in the Eastern District of New York? So okay. I had been a judge. I was really very lucky. I felt that I was prepared for the job I was now getting. I'd been on the criminal side as an assistant U.S. attorney, on the civil side as a partner at a law firm. I'd also been a judge for four and a half years uh, in the Eastern District. So I kind of had t covered all the bases and felt ready to do the job. It wasn't all that different. Which brings me to another question. What's the difference between a magistrate and a judge? Are they the same? No, they're not the same. First of all, they're both called judge. So I can't say the difference between a magistrate and a judge because everybody's a judge. But the magistrate judges are selected by the court itself. All the judges in the court pick the magistrate judge, whereas I said already the district judges and the court of appeals are, and of course the Supreme Court, are chosen by the president and confirmed by Congress. So it's, it's a different type of appointment. But the power is different. The magistrate judge can't try a felony criminal case. Only a district judge can do that. And a magistrate judge doesn't try a civil cases except on consent of the parties. And sometimes they do consent and sometimes they don't consent. Otherwise, the magistrate judge does not have the jurisdiction to try even a civil case, certainly not a felony criminal case. So their role is more to handle the pretrial work in some districts, they do all the discovery work. In our court, they did a lot of settlement work, wonderful work. They, they tried to help settle our civil cases when the judge couldn't do that because the trial judge probably shouldn't be meeting with the party separately. So the magistrate judge worked on settlements, pretrial, and they do all the arraignments. So when a criminal case comes in, they have to handle all the first appearance, the initial appearance, which is called the arraignment. Then the district judge, judge gets the case. What kind of training there is for the federal bench. Do you go to judge school? Yes, we do. We call it baby judge school. So we all went through baby judge school, uh, which was held by the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., and all the new judges are flown in, and we spend, uh, was it maybe close to two weeks with uh, people lecturing, experienced judges helping us learn the different aspects of judging. And then, if I recall, about three months later, they give you a third week. So it's the advanced training. Uh, and then they give you continuing legal education throughout your career. So every year or so, there's a, there's a seminar for all district judges with topics that they're interested in. We used to get a form saying, which of these topics interest you most? And I guess the ones that get the most check marks uh, get the lecture. So there's always education for judges. The same for magistrate judges, bankruptcy judges, appellate judges, everybody but Supreme Court judges. As far as I know, they don't go to school. Um, you pointed out earlier that a judge doesn't get to choose your cases. That's right. Um, you're assigned to them. Were there cases that you wish you could have gotten out of? Oh, that's a very interesting question. You know, yes, as your career goes on, there are some cases that become repetitive. And when the judge takes what's called senior status, which I took at 65 and many judges take at 65, then you're allowed to come out of certain wheels. You can't choose your cases, but you can choose you can not to. Out. That's right. You can opt out of certain mm -hmm. kinds of cases. And the judges all tend to opt out of the same kind. So some of us do get tired of certain kinds of cases. So are, are, are there particular kinds of cases that most judge, a lot of judges opt out of? I and knew what you were going to ask. I don't know that I should say, but uh, <laughs> I remember that we Many judges opt out of the uh, overtime cases under the Fair Labor Standards Act. It's not that they're not important, but they get a bit repetitive. Some judges opt out of what's called pro se cases, which are brought by individuals without lawyers. I actually stayed in the pro se cases because I, th I think there's always a possibility there that somebody really does need help. This is where the, 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 the person is representing himself, himself. Him or herself, right. right. Uh, some judges get tired of employment cases, which have a bit of repetition, social security cases, reviewing a social security record by an administrative law judge. I guess those are the least popular groups. I'm not saying I opted out of all those, but those aren't the popular ones. Mm -hmm. The case that put you, you know, in the headlines right. was the case that challenged the constitutionality of the New York Police Department's stop and frisk policy. You wrote a 195-page decision 
concluding that um, the police department had resorted to a policy of indirect racial profiling in minority communities. And you ordered sweeping reforms in that policy and that a monitor be appointed to oversee the reforms. Uh, is it accurate to say that you were appalled by what you saw going on in the police department? It, it is accurate. The only thing I always like to correct when, when someone asks me is, I, stop and frisk if practiced correctly is still legal and it still is being practiced and that's fair as long as it's done right. What was appalling was the huge number of stops. It had hit a high of close to 700,000 stops in, in 2011 of innocent people overwhelmingly. We know this because there was no summons, there was no arrest. The people were just stopped and their life was interrupted, even if it was only interrupted for an hour and a half. That's long. I mean, if you were busy... And they tended to be people of color. Absolutely. And if you were on your way to this studio and somebody stopped you for an hour and a half for no reason, I think you'd be furious. I think you'd sue the next morning. And, and of course, some people did. But the, the pra practice, the policy as practiced, bred lack of trust in the community. The community was, was um, not respectful of the police anymore. There was a real tension between the police and the community. And so even the police department came to see, I think, and has certainly seen now, that, that if you want the help of the community to make things better and to police themselves and to work with the police to stop crime, because nobody's for crime, but then you can't do this. You can't be stopping people just because they look suspicious to you. And so I, why was the NYPD conducting so many stop and frisk, uh, mostly, uh, I guess, black and Latino right, males, right. nine out of ten of whom had done nothing wrong? Right. Why were they doing it? Because I think the policy then, from the top down, is that they really believe that these are the people committing the crimes, and they're also the people who have the guns and the drugs, and if they're fearful that they're going to be stopped, then they'll leave their guns at home and they won't carry the drugs and you will reduce crime. That was the theory. Now what we've now learned is that when we're down to 25,000 stops in this year, we're on track for 15 and 16 to have that number, crime is staying down. It hasn't made a difference. I saw figures for 16 just the other day. We're on track for a lower murder rate and a lower uh, serious felony rate than we've seen in a long time. So it obviously didn't achieve what they thought it would, but they, I think they, they deeply believed it. These were people who, who were not evil. I mean, they believed what they were doing was a good method of fighting crime. The Bloomberg administration accused you of showing partiality in that case, I guess because of some statements you made to the press, and you were, after your ruling, you were removed from that case. I guess that meant you would no longer supervise, you know, what they were doing going forward. But your ruling stood, correct? Absolutely, because the ruling was appealed uh, under Mayor Bloomberg, and Mayor de Blasio withdrew the appeal. So it was never heard by the appellate court. As far as statements that I made to the press, that's unfortunately not accurate. The only statement quoted in the very short ruling um, that the circuit court uh, issued was what somebody else said I said. So it was really hearsay. It was a very troubling uh, ruling on their part. And as you probably know, I hope you know, they backed down. Mm -hmm. Two or three weeks later, they issued a second opinion, which withdrew the first opinion. So um, from a legal perspective, um, there is no first opinion. The second opinion then said, oh, we never meant to say that she violated any ethics rules at all. We're just worried about the appearance of impropriety that somewhere, somebody, somehow would think so. And so we're going to stick with our decision to reassign the cases. What I found very troubling in their opinion is the other part of the issue, which was they said that I had uh, run afoul of the related case rule. That, of course, made no sense because the city never objected to the, the three cases being related to each other. And when they were reassigned to the judge who's now handling the case, they were reassigned together as related. So it was really quite an embarrassment for the, for the circuit panel that ruled because clearly the cases were related. They all challenged the same policy. And they're together today for one set of reforms. Is there someone, is there, is there a, a special monitor who monitors the whole stop and frisk 
Well, of course, that's the person I pointed. Okay. Peter Zimroth is the monitor today. That is the person I chose. I'm sure he's doing a great job. He's issued a couple of major reports. The judge obviously kept him on. Uh, so it's, it, the reforms that, that I and, that it, I had uh, written about are taking place today. And how have they changed how they operate in terms of stop and frisk? Well, you know, I'm not uh, involved day to day anymore, uh, so I don't have that hands-on knowledge, but I know that they've written new guidelines as to how to make a proper stop. They've created new training materials. They are documenting the stops in a new way so that one can go back and look at the paperwork. They are disciplining officers who violate that. And of course, the body camera experiment uh, came from me. I mean, that was the earliest that I know of, of a use of body cameras by a major police department. There had been experiments in a couple of very small towns, but this was major for, for a police department the size of New York City to start using body cameras. Do they all have them now? No, or? I don't think so. No, 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 not all police officers. I think it was still done on a sort of test basis. I had suggested certain precincts, but I think they took a different way of doing it, but doesn't matter. It, it's still a uh, test, if you want to call it that. It's not the right word, but I can't think of the right word. But it's, it's, a, it's an experiment. Quotas has been a big issue um, in New York City, certainly in terms of arrest. Did they have quotas for stops as well? Well, that was denied, of course, by the uh, higher up police officials who testified at the trial. But there were witnesses from the police department who testified that there were quotas. Didn't, I didn't have to really determine the credibility, whether the higher-ups were right about quotas or whether the people who decided to be whistleblowers were right. I'm not sure who was right, but there were tapes that were played at the trial that, that had been secretly recorded of roll call meetings, and it sounded close to it. Those tapes didn't say, we're going to make 100 stops today, but it said, if you don't make stops, you're a zero. Nobody wants to work with a zero, so go out there and make sure you do a lot of stops. And yeah. if, you, you know, if you don't do a lot, you're not doing your job. So it seemed close to the idea, but I don't think there was any direct testimony of certain actual target numbers. Even before the stop and frisk case, you presided over the trial of Francis, is it Lavoti or Lavati? Lavoti. Lavoti, the former police officer who was convicted of violating the civil rights of Anthony Baez, a man who died in a confrontation with Officer Lavoti. Mm -hmm. Over football. I remember writing a column mm. that, you know, New York was the only state where it was a capital offense to play touch football because that's what, you know, died, um, right, the died. Bias brothers were doing, uh, right. you know, outside the place where they lived and the, the ball kept bouncing right. off the top of a police car nearby and then there's this confrontation and Bias winds up dead. Right. Uh, and of course, you had um, in the last few years certainly a lot of publicity given to these police shootings of unarmed black males. Did you form the opinion from cases that you presided over that the police frequently violate the rights of citizens and especially of citizens who are not white? Well, let's, t let's start for a minute with the Lavoti case itself. What was so troubling in that case is that what killed Mr. Baez was a chokehold. And the chokehold had been recently banned by the police department. So it was not not supposed to be used. And this officer had used it before. And he had injured somebody, and he'd actually been sentenced for doing that. So why was he even still on the beat? Why was he out there doing what he does and then using this illegal chokehold that killed somebody? And it makes the mind jump to Eric Garner. I mean, there you again had the use of a chokehold which by then was years later. And it was still banned by the police department and it was still used and Eric Garner died. So there does seem to be some police officers who abuse their power. Now, I, uh, I'm very interested in this topic. We as federal judges get cases that are called 1983 lawsuits. That's a section of the U.S. Code that allows a citizen to sue when somebody acting under color of right, which means a police officer, violates their constitutional rights. We get many, many 1983 cases where citizens claim that they were wrongfully uh, treated by the police. And many of those cases are settled by the New York City Police Department because the policeman did something wrong. 
I'm sure if it was a percentage, it's a low percentage of all police officers, but if you look at the whole country and if you look at the last two years alone, there have been awful lot of high profile, shall we say, uh, police violence towards citizens that have really raised the public's awareness of this as a national problem. It's not just New York. After all, the real publicity began with Ferguson. Um, and it has gone on from there. And there are indictments. Uh, the fellow who, the police officer who shot Walter Scott was indicted last week. So there are some indictments coming uh, down. You know, the, one of the Freddie Gray policemen is on trial this week. So the country's paying attention. I think, yeah. this, I think this stimulated the Black Lives Matter movement. It really, no question. It really did. And I've spoken on it. I have an article coming out in the National Black Law Review should be out shortly and it tracks a number of these cases. So I'm really seriously interested in this. Again, this is, going back to your first question, this is one thing I hope I can do yeah. more, is speak out, write, and if I'm very lucky, get appointed uh, as a monitor, like the monitor in New York, to help reform a police department anywhere in the country. And not just police, I'm very interested in prisons. I just wrote a major opinion on solitary confinement, which thanks to Governor Cuomo um, and the Department of Corrections, they settled a case of mine with real reforms in solitary confinement. So I'm interested in these topics. And you talk about uh, areas where you hope to make a difference going forward. Um, New York City recently reached a settlement with the U.S. Attorney's Office to instigate major reforms at Rikers Island, where in recent years there have been numerous reports uh, alleging terrible abuse of inmates by corrections officers, uh, inmates who've been left to die even though they've asked for medical help. Uh, about that terrible prison loaf, which was something something inevitable that they were f feeding uh, to inmates in solitary. The kind of abuse that you think harks back to 1930s uh, films. Um, is prison reform uh, or treatment of inmates, uh, is that an area you are interested in getting involved with or you think really needs attention? Oh, I do. I mean, this country has way too many people in prison for way too long. We call it mass incarceration. I'm sure you're fully familiar with it. So that's one problem right there that I'm interested in. But secondly, once you're in prison, the way you are treated as a prisoner in this country is not acceptable. Other countries, you'd be amazed how they really, really work with the prisoners to rehabilitate them. So when they do leave, they don't come back and they can enter society. Here, if you're subjected to violence and if you're subjected to years in solitary, it affects your mental health. I mean, you don't come out ready to enter society. You come out damaged, you go back to crime, you go back to jail. It is not a good thing. So prison reform is something I really do care about. And I started to mention the solitary confinement case I had. I think that's where you read about the prison loaf. That's one of the things that was banned because of my case. So I'm very, very But that pleased. they were doing it in the 2000s. I oh, yes. Oh, yes. It, in solitary in New York. But as a result of this settlement in a case called Peoples versus Fisher, which was mine, it's not going to be done anymore. Okay. We've, so. got, we've got a minute left in which you can tell us about what you feel your, were your biggest accomplishments as a federal judge. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've touched on two of them. I mean, the solitary confinement case was really important to me. Surely the stop and frisk case was important to me. I had a Medicare reform case where I really cared about old people getting the services they're entitled to. So I would say, you know, any and all of the cases where I was able to affect the rights of thousands of people at once, uh, I had another big case that's too, too hard to go into now, it would take too long, but it had to do with being reincarcerated without a judge having ordered it. That's not right. So there were so many decisions like that over the years that I really care about, and it was a wonderful part of the job. Well, you leave a, a big legacy behind as you go off the bench, and I'm sure you're going to be doing a lot of um, excellent um, <laughs> acts of public service well, I hope going so. forward. I hope so. Thank you. We're out of time. I want to thank former federal district court judge Shira Shendlin. I know we're going to be hearing a lot more from her over the next few months and years. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. 
you can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at CUNY.TV and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.